Delegates from around the world sit down at the fourth and final round of the Nuclear Security Summit. President Park Geun-hye is also there with a message. Koreans overseas have started casting their ballots for the upcoming general elections. What significance do these votes carry? And the Korea-China Free Trade Agreement has been in effect for over a hundred days now. How have the two sides benefited and what can be done to further Korea's interests? Welcome to News Inside. I'm Ahn Jung Hyun. Let's welcome back our panelists. Professor Shin Sang Yup is with us once again. And Dr. Bong Young Shik is back. Good to see you again. Let's get straight into our first topic of discussion. The Nuclear Security Summit is taking place in Washington from Thursday to Friday local time. The meeting is aimed at preventing nuclear terrorism around the world and was first held in 2010 under the proposal of U.S. President Barack Obama. This year is the fourth and final meeting. Attending this year are some 20 heads of state, including President Park Geun-hye, U.S. President Obama, Chinese President Xi Jinping and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, as well as over 50 representatives from international bodies, such as the UN, the European Union and the IAEA. Let's see what the main agenda of this year's meeting is. So one of the central issues is how to prevent weapons of mass destruction from falling into the hands of extremist groups mm -hmm. like the IS. We've seen uh, more terrorist attacks recently uh, that the IS has claimed responsibility for, which goes to show that there's no place really that is safe from terrorism anymore. Um, I'm sure Korea shares the sentiment as well. I think the uh, Korea is no more safe from the uh, terrorism. Uh, well, I think the, uh, according to uh, the report uh, released by the, uh, one of the American mass media, actually they quote from one of the American uh, the consulting company about the security issues. According to them, the estimated number of the foreigners who joined to the IS as of the end of last year, it is about 27,000 up to 31,000. And then, uh, according to the analysis made by them, the 20 or up to 30 percent of foreign uh, members of IS, they uh, participate in the operation in the country where they come from. Mm -hmm. And then this is the point which we have to pay attention to. And the second one is, actually, the IS uh, released the so-called the list of the countries. I mean, which they are. Uh, well, the, as a potential target. Hostile uh, countries. Hostile countries, right. yes. And then Korea is one of the, uh, the, uh, the least. So I think the, considering this one, the Korea is now free from the uh, terrorism because that, as we can see, uh, the situations happening in Paris and other European countries, well, the, uh, we cannot prevent the possibility from the, uh, seeing that Koreans could the participate in the, some terrorist activities or operations in Korea. So certainly there is a high possibility. We can see uh, the, uh, we are imposed to the threats of the terrorists. Well, the Korea. National Intelligence Service, though, says it is on the lookout mm -hmm. for possible signs. Mm -hmm. mm. Now, North Korea is not the central focus <coughs> of the summit uh, this time, but it is being discussed extensively. Why do you think President Park chose this summit to stress the danger of Pyongyang's nuclear program? Well, stressing the danger of a Pyongyang with a nuclear and missile capability um, may not be the central agenda of this uh, nuclear security summit, but uh, that's how usually the summit uh, diplomacy is uh, working, that not only the head of the states would gather in the summit meetings to discuss the central issue, but they uh, w would like to take the advantage of the opportunity to sit together to exchange a candid opinion on other important issues. And timing is perfect for President Park geun to remind all the countries related to North Korea's nuclear and missile threat uh, that uh, it is still uh, very essential for all these countries to maintain the momentum to put continued pressure on North Korea to change its strategic calculation with regard to continued possession and deployment of WMD. Mm -hmm. It's common good, not only for South Korea or for United States, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. every country. Mm -hmm. Now, on the sidelines of this summit, the leaders of Korea, the U.S., and Japan mm -hmm. held trilateral talks to discuss um, Pyongyang's nuclear program mm -hmm. in detail. 
What impact do you think this kind of trilateral cooperation will have on mm -hmm. North Korea? I think definitely it will uh, be a very important uh, factor which can change the North Korean leader's mind. I mean, uh, the reason why? Because the USA uh, is number one the country and in terms of uh, military power in the world. And Japan, uh, well, it is the second largest economy in the world, and also Japanese government changed its constitution. So its influence, I mean, military influence is over the reason is going to be increased. And then uh, certainly by having the trilateral cooperation, I think it can be a kind of some pushing factors changing the uh, Chinese government policy toward North Korea. Mm. So the, by having the uh, step up the trilateral cooperation in the region, we can directly or indirectly affect the uh, North Korean uh, government policies in the region. Well, there was also a series of bilateral summits uh, with the U.S., China, and Japan. Considering the timing of these meetings, um, could we think of Seoul as uh, looking for ways to maximize the effects of all these sanctions against North Korea? Definitely. Uh, it is very important for South Korea to urge all the related parties to maintain the previous commitment on continually putting pressure on North Korea in the aftermath of its fourth nuclear test and the missile launch, uh, which was only a few months ago. Mm -hmm. And it is not uh, already too, too early for us to say that economic sanctions have uh, made enough effect on changing the behavior of North Korea, and it is time to uh, think of dialogue with North Korea. Um, the UN Security Council Resolution 2270 uh, stipulates all the countries to deny call for the North Korean vessels to enter the port. Uh, and it also listed 31 vessels registered to North Korean company OMM, Ocean Maritime Management. Uh, but by the request of the Chinese government, uh, four out of the 31 vessels listed on the list uh, have been released. Uh, that's why the Philippine government had to release the Jintang uh, vessel, mm. uh, which had been originally uh, kept uh, in accordance with the UN Security Council Resolution 2270. So there is uh, some signs that uh, international coordination cooperation to put uh, you know, pressure on North Korea is beginning to show some um, you know, micro fractures. So it is time for South Korea with the, uh, the uh, coordination with the United States and Japan to uh, remind mm. all the related parties that it is too, too premature to move from uh, strong economic sanctions to uh, test with the dialogue with mm. North Korea. Mm. Uh, as long as North Korea has not shown clear sign that it has changed its, its strict calculation between regime survival and continued possession of nuclear weapons. Mm. 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 I guess it would take a while for us to see whether uh, these, not just these UN sanctions, but all these uh, unilateral and independent sanctions that the countries have imposed on North Korea will actually work. Right, but definitely um, by throwing the strategic card of uh, uh, simultaneously discussing mm -hmm. not only denuclearization of North Korea, but also uh, signing of the peace treaty to mm -hmm. put a permanent end uh, to Korean war on the Korean Peninsula. The China, China has, has been trying to put kind of a, a driving wedge you know, among mm. three parties <laughs> uh, o over the North Korean uh, nuclear issues. So nothing has changed. Nothing really has changed. So we have to stay the course until mm. North Korea will come out with a fundamentally different uh, posture with regard to its nuclear uh, weapon program. Mm. Mm. Now, Korea successfully hosted the 2012 Nuclear Security yes. Summit, mm. and at the end of this year, we are set to chair the ministerial level mm. IAEA mm. Nuclear Security Conference. Mm. So it seems uh, it is crucial for us to uh, carry the momentum from this uh, nuclear summit since our interests are directly inter intertwined with mm, North Korea's mm, nuclear program. Mm. What can Seoul do in this regard? Well, certainly since 2012, uh, the uh, nuclear summit, uh, when the nuclear summit was held, the Co Korean government has made every effort to increase its, its influences in dealing with nuclear or weapon issues or nuclear-related issues. And then, as you pointed out, the Korea became the chair at the ministerial level of the IAEA Security Conference. 
And the, uh, through this kind of the opportunities, I think the Korean government, if I quote from the government officials and Minister of Foreign Affairs, they want to uh, the, uh, uh, strengthen the IAEA's role, mm -hmm. influences uh, in the F in an efforts to dealing with the various nuclear weapons and nuclear issues in the world. At the same time, I mean, through the uh, several times of the uh, nuclear summits, there has been some uh, discussions about the how the national government can contribute to the uh, strengthen the functions, the role of the conference or the international or IAEA uh, in dealing with the uh, nuclear issues. So I think the, those kind of efforts that the Korean government wants to uh, institutionalize those kind of things uh, within the frame of, within the system of IAEA. I think those kind of things could be summarized as the uh, one or two main the objectives or goal of the Korean government uh, whenever they participate in this kind of conference or take the uh, uh, some role uh, such as chairpersonship or chairmanship of the uh, host country of the uh, nuclear conferences. Hopefully mm -hmm. we can uh, keep the momentum going. Let's move on to the general elections now. We only have 13 days to go and voting for overseas Koreans began on Wednesday. Well, here are some details about overseas voting and its significance. Overseas voting, which gives Koreans living abroad the right to vote, was first introduced in 2012 for the 19th National Assembly general elections. This round is the third, also having taken place during the 18th presidential election. The government has set up 198 polling stations at consulates around the world, as well as on ships. Statistics show Asia plus Australia and New Zealand combined has the largest number of registered voters at 80,000. The Americas followed with 50,000 and with all regions together, 154,217 people registered to cast their ballots. This accounts for 7.8% of the total number of estimated eligible voters overseas, which amounts to nearly 2 million. Compared to the some 56,000 that voted in the previous general elections, it's a 24.8% increase. Due to the physical setup, the cost for overseas voting for each person amounts to 30 times what it would cost at home. But regardless of the money and participation rate, overseas voting is still considered an essential system to embrace overseas Koreans as being part of one nation. Voting overseas is considered imperative in furthering democracy and protecting voters' rights once they're abroad, as each and every vote counts in an election. Out of the almost 2 million eligible voters overseas, only 154,000 have registered to vote. That's about 7.8%, a lot mm -hmm. lower than expected. Why do you think the rate is so low? <laughs> there is a theory in um, election politics that people want to vote uh, when two conditions are met. One is that they are sure that their vote will count. Mm -hmm. And second, it is convenient enough for them to go out and vote. Otherwise, they have so many other temptations, especially in case of Korea, when election day is designated by the government, thankfully, as a national holiday. Mm -hmm. Which is not really the case, apparently, <laughs> uh, for overseas voters right now. They mm -hmm. actually have to travel to polling yes, exactly. stations. Well, the National uh, Election Commission reported that there has been some improvement in the uh, voting Registration. Registration system. Mm -hmm. 
but still, the, it is clear that in case of, for example, in the United States, the, if Korean uh, uh, Americans, if they want to the vote, they have to travel a lot. According to the National Election Commission, they said that registered votes are required to carry a valid form of photo identification such as passport or the uh, resident registration card or something like that. And they should visit the uh, nearby polling uh, station. Polling station. Mm. Uh, even though, according to them, uh, there are 198 polling stations around the world, more specifically speaking, 113 countries around the world. So you have to find one nearest you. <laughs> yes. So I think this is one of the practical difficulties mm. for the, uh, the I mean, Koreans living in foreign countries. Mm -hmm. So, um, as uh, Professor Shin just mentioned, it seems we can do more. And the, yes, the system has improved over the years, but it seems we can do more to increase the rate of participation. I mean, after all, it took us a while to reintroduce overseas voting, right? After that constitutional court ruling in 2007 mm -hmm. lifted a decades-old ban. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, even we, uh, who are uh, voters uh, residing in South Korea, have many benefits by the government that we receive the, uh, the notification that the voting days uh, is uh, near, and it is very convenient <coughs> enough for us to just walk to the voting booth, which does not exist for uh, Korean nationals living abroad. Mm -hmm. So maintaining the parity and uh, fairness is always very tricky business in electoral politics, but you have to see the big picture mm -hmm. uh, at the same time take into due account <coughs> for the regional you know, uh, difficulties uh, in order to encourage uh, voting behavior of the Korean nationals mm -hmm. outside. I'd like to add that uh, this system which allowed uh, Korean uh, nationals living abroad uh, able to vote is, it reflects a very peculiar aspect of uh, Korean citizenship. Mm. In many Western democracy, your citizenship is not really primarily defined by mm. ethnicity. Mm. Uh, as long as uh, you pay tax for foreign governments, then you're no longer mm. defined according to your ethnicity. But in case of Korea, mm -hmm. ethnicity still rules that you are still Korean as long as you maintain the bloodline. Even line. if you don't live here and right. even if you don't pay your the taxes The sense of us or URI mm -hmm. is a strongly uh, reflective in this government uh, measures to encourage uh, voters by the Korean nationals abroad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do you suggest we uh, solve the problem of accessibility for these overseas voters? I mean, there's been talk of uh, introducing things like uh, voting by mail mm -hmm. or internet right. voting. I mean, uh, there have been already made uh, important uh, progresses and changes by the uh, National Election uh, Committee that um, the registration uh, does not have to be uh, made by physical visit to the Consul General mm -hmm. uh, in many places, but you can just register uh, your intention to vote by the Internet. And once you register, then uh, you can just uh, uh, use it many times over uh, in the future. Um, so <coughs> they used to uh, make uh, at least two visits to the uh, Korean Embassy or General Consul to first uh, for registration, then actual voting. Right. But uh, those uh, obstacles have been eliminated. So. Let's watch. I mean, the rate of registration this time is only 7.8%, but I think this low rate is a reflection of the uh, disappointment uh, by, uh, with the previous experience uh, with the old you know, voting system. Mm. So uh, who knows? Uh, we, it can be hoped that uh, uh, Korean residents abroad uh, will be more encouraged by the new systems too. Mm exercise their uh, civic mm. rights. So why would you say it's important that we encourage more mm -hmm. overseas Koreans to vote in elections that are taking place here? Well, according to the report, about the 1.98 million eligible people, I mean, Koreans living around the world, and then the only 7 or 8 person people are, are expe as expected to participate in the vote. So that is very important. I mean, uh, why their votes are very important, I think I can uh, say two things. The first one is uh, by allowing them to uh, cast a vote, participate in the election happening in Korea, definitely uh, we will uh, the, uh, conf make them confirm that they are Koreans. Mm -hmm. Well, I think considering the number of Koreans living overseas, uh, I mean, as we know very well, it, it increased, has increased very rapidly. 
So I think the, uh, it can be very important for, for us to build a very strong career or great career. Definitely, they should be part of career. So to, to build those kind of the, to touch those kinds of the, uh, the side of sense, I think the, uh, by allowing them to uh, cast a vote is very important. Another one is actually we are living in a democracy country, right? So I mean, in democratic system, the uh, minor people's voice, I mean, minor groups people's voice is very important. In this context, I think we have to listen to the voices from the Koreans living overseas. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, it is uh, uh, another issue to be considered that uh, those uh, overseas residential voters or the absentee voters who temporarily uh, left the country. Mm -hmm. Um, can the second type of the uh, overseas voters can vote for both uh, the district uh, elections and the proportional representation, but the first type of the Korean voters overseas can only vote for the members um, in the proportional representation. So there is a kind of overriding sense that their votes do not really matter mm. in the overall uh, politics in South Korea. So it is important for the South Korean government to imbue them with a uh, sense of significance uh, as a swing voters uh, to decide the future of South Korean politics. Mm. Otherwise, then they would prefer to use their time for different things. Well, let's hope for a continued improvement of the system and a higher rate of participation by overseas Koreans in the future. Shifting gears now to the economy, Monday marked the 100th day of the Korea-China Free Trade Agreement. There are high expectations for the deal when it came into effect in December of last year. Let's see how well we've done so far. Following 30 months of negotiations after holding the first round of official free trade talks, Korea and China announced they had concluded the bilateral trade deal. And in December, the free trade pact went into effect. With China accounting for 26% of Korea's exports, many companies had high hopes. 먼저 중국에 나가 있는 카고에 대해서 어, 가, 가 인증 업체로 선정되어 원산지 증명이 신속하게 발해, 발급이 돼요. 향후 저희 매출이나 신장 효과는 20에서 30%가 될 걸로 예상이 됩니다. 얼마 전 중국 업체와 공급 계약을 체결했고 올해 말그 수출 계획도 있어. FTA 발효 1차 연도부터 직접적인 혜택이 있을 것으로 판단되고 있습니다. 그 관제 절감 효과만 약 수만 달러에 이를 것으로 기대하고 있고. A survey conducted by the Korea International Trade Association shortly after the FTA took effect indicates that 40% of the respondents believed exports to China would increase. To make sure companies are able to make maximum use of the trade pact, Korea's Customs Service set up a separate body offering proactive support for the business community. Results showed that applied electronics, metalworking machinery, apparel, and aluminum showed particular growth in exports. The Customs Office also said the higher the rate of tariff reductions went from three percentage points, it led to a sharp increase in exports. But with China's slowing economy and tensions still high on the Korean peninsula, not all conditions look optimistic. In order to bring Korea's exports to the world's second largest economy up to speed, Seoul will have to seek smarter ways to make optimal use of the free trade agreement. So we're now over 100 days into this mm. trade pact. It's probably too early to say, but based on what we've seen so far, um, what score would you give on a scale of 1 to 10? Well, uh, I'm quite generous in some sense, mm. but I want to give about 8 out of 10. Well, the, there are two, very, uh, two reasons. The first one is, as you know very well, over the several years, the Korean exports to China has decreased very rapidly. Uh, if I give you data, as of the end of February this year, Korean exports to China was about $18.1 billion, which was about 17.6% lower from the same period last year. Mm -hmm. And how about the imports? Imports from China was about, the, uh, as of the end of February, was $12.9 billion, which was about 14% lower than the 
from the same period last year. So when you look at the import and export, uh, the volume between two countries, we can see uh, both of them recorded the uh, decrease. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the more details, uh, the contents of the exports and imports, after the, uh, the FTA was signed and it went to effect between two countries, some major very important products, I mean exports of major products to China have recorded a dramatic increase. Let me give you an example. The uh, uh, products that were subject to tariff cuts about three up to six percent points, such as electric devices mm -hmm. and the uh, metal working machines and aluminum um, and uh, apparel. Uh, well, these are materials, I mean these items are recorded very high the uh, growth in its exports to China. Because of the tariff cuts? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we can say that a total of 344 export goods uh, benefited from Korea-China FTA. Mm. But, well, I think so when you look at the uh, overhaul, the export and imports volume between two countries, uh, both of them uh, show the uh, minus. Mm -hmm. But owing to Korea-China FTA, we could minimize the, uh, we could control the decreasing uh, the uh, amount mm -hmm. in its F, I mean, exports and the uh, imports. So I want to give the uh, uh, quite generous score uh, to Korea contr contribution of the Korea-China FTA. Well, one obvious effect Korea hoped for was a pickup in exports. Uh, you said exports in general dropped, but that could also be because of the slowing uh, mm. Chinese mm. economic expansion. Mm. Um, at the same time, though, there, there is a problem that is arising, and it is that China seems to be employing more um, protectionist policies, mm. and we're increasingly facing non-tariff trade mm. barriers, mm. aren't mm. we? China is certainly uh, one of the largest markets in the world. Particularly for Korea, China has been the number one trading partner. Out of total Korean exports, uh, the China uh, accounted for 26% mm -hmm. as of the end of last year. Definitely a big, big uh, partner for us. When you look at the uh, Chinese or the economic policies, as you uh, mentioned, uh, there has been very big changes. Chinese government adopted so-called China Insight Policy. Mm -hmm. They want to change the quality of its economic foundation. They encourage their local companies to produce the uh, value-added products which were uh, the imported from other countries such as Korea and Japan and the USA. But by changing the quality of the uh, economy, I mean, they want to increase the production I mean, made by the local companies. They want to the, uh, increase the value creation capacity in its, in its economy. This means for us, we will lose our market. That is the problem one for us. Second one is actually, we have to look at ourselves. Uh, well, the, I think the Korean the companies have been a little bit lazy in some sense to uh, develop themselves. What I mean is that uh, when I look at the, uh, the market distribution of Korean exporting exports, well, as I said before, it has been too much concentrated. So uh, when you look at the, uh, the, uh, the other countries, the, competitive, I mean, the competitors for us, they, have, they make every effort to diversify their markets. Mm -hmm. In this context, we have been behind them. Second one is actually when you look at the major exporting items of Korean, well, over the last 10 years that there have been not big changes in our so-called strategic the exporting items, cars, ships, and then the uh, well, heavy, heavy chemical industries, so something like that. But when you look at the uh, other country, I mean, particularly uh, uh, advanced economies, I mean, certainly there has been big, big changes uh, well, such as the uh, Germany, they have are, uh, they are emerging as one of the aircraft producers in the global market. Uh, Japan also tried to uh, the, uh, develop new items, uh, which will have the very competitive advantage in the global market, but we don't. So because of these two reasons, definitely, I think the, uh, we are facing more difficulties uh, in our economy. Mm. 
Now, when Seoul was going through a rough patch with Beijing over the potential deployment of the U.S. missile defense system FAD, there were concerns that China may um, employ retaliatory trade policies. Do you think those concerns are still valid? Let's assume that you have a friend and you, uh, you made a mistake and the friend uh, used its economic might to punish you for uh, what's seemingly a small matter uh, for friendship, then you cannot really count on that. Uh, the person as a true friend mm. in need. So, uh, I hope that uh, China's strategic decision will not be in line of using its economic leverage on South Korea to achieve uh, strategic interest. Um, it is true that uh, there are precedents in which China actually used economic leverage to fulfill its uh, strategic uh, interest. Uh, it uh, you know, banned the uh, Korean export of cell phones to Chinese market mm -hmm. when South Korean government ruled uh, dumping on Chinese export of garlic mm -hmm. uh, like a decade ago. And Chinese government uh, suspended its export of rare earth, mm -hmm. uh, essential ingredient in manufacturing uh, cell phones by Japanese companies mm -hmm. in retaliation of the Japanese government, the no doubt administration's decision to <coughs> try to prosecute and try the uh, captain of the Chinese fishing boat, mm. which entered and collided with the Japanese maritime agency uh, at the sea near uh, the Senkaku and Dayutai in Chinese, uh, which Japanese government claimed the sovereign territory of Japan. So you cannot really rule out uh, the possibility of Chinese government attempted to use the uh, economic leverage on South Korea as a major uh, trading partner to push South Korean government to change its decision on mm. the potential mm. deployment of uh, U.S. thought inside South Korea. Mm. But uh, we have to also consider uh, the uh, poss possibility whether it will be in the best interest of China, not best interest of South Korea. China can, but it is another matter whether China can afford to make the retaliation with economic means. Mm. For several reasons. One is that if China retaliates with economic sanctions or um, some strategic economic policy towards South Korea, then they will compare South Korea even further distance itself from China and move closer to uh, United States and Japan, Japan this mm -hmm. time to forge higher level of security partnership. And the biggest concern for China at this stage, as it reflected in its uh, uh, con persistent opposition to the deployment of that, indicates is to see U.S.-Korea security partnership, which is currently focused on deterring local threat from North Korea, to become a kind of regional uh, security partnership that will be used to contain entire China. Mm -hmm. China seems to be a vast country, but the vast country is surrounded by 14 countries, and most of them are not really friendly toward China. So I don't know whether Chinese government want to create another headache by rattling, by rattling South Korea by using uh, economic retaliation. And South Korea's uh, provocative and assertive action toward South Korea uh, will undermine the legitimacy and attractiveness of its proposal to create the China-centered free trade regime in the world, mm. uh, namely the RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. If China behaves assertively towards South Korea because of the security matter surrounding the deployment of that, then South Korea and other countries observing China's uh, behavior will walk away from China's proposal for RCEP and move closer to the U.S. counter proposal of Trans-Pacific Partnership. So it is choice uh, left to be uh, de decided by China whether it is worth to put economic pressure on South Korea. Mm. It might end up leaving a bad precedent, you're saying, right. right? In the meantime, though, one of the merits of the Korea-China FTA has already been rendered useless because of the closure of the Kaesong Industrial Complex. Right. But we have to engage in a uh, you know, sound counterfactual analysis whether the decision by the South Korean government to close the Kaesong Industrial Complex was the right strategic decision. Of course, there is a um, significant economic loss by closing the KIC. But at the same time, we have to uh, keep in mind that 
it was an extremely urgent situation in terms of South Korea fulfilling its basic duty as a sovereign government uh, to protect the uh, safety of South Korean uh, people, businessmen, inside the Kaesong Industrial Complex. And when other countries uh, were uh, announcing their own very strong uni unilateral economic sanctions on North Korea, after North Korea's fourth nuclear test. South Korea, South Korea could not just afford sitting back, maintaining the usual policy toward North Korea, which generates the risk of uh, continually uh, allowing North Korea to get the uh, uh, financial revenues to support its uh, WMD right. uh, production. If South Korea had not demonstrated its uh, strongest resolve in response to North Korea's provocation, toward China, there, there is a good chance that China um, would not have been agreeing on very strong sanctions via uh, UN Security Council on North Korea. Might have sent mixed signals. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If South Korea uh, had been seen soft, then China would mm -hmm. not uh, have felt the uh, sufficient pressure to follow mm -hmm. the suit mm -hmm. to punish uh, North Korea cool. with a very strong mm -hmm. economic sanctions. Mm -hmm. So it is unfortunate that South Korea and its companies suffer a great deal of a business loss, but at the same time, you have to see the big picture. Mm. Mm. So what more can Seoul do to um, ensure a maximum return mm. from this bilateral deal? Well, first of all, the, uh, when you look at the um, uh, Korean exporting items to Chinese market, well, the Korean export has been concentrated in manufacturing sector. Right. But when you look at the Chinese economy, the service sector is really, really huge, untouched the blue ocean in some sense. And it is more value-added sector, industrial sector. Mm -hmm. So I think the Korean government should have to encourage the Korean companies in service sector uh, should have to uh, pioneer more service market in China. <clears throat> it will be very important in the future economic relations between two countries. And lastly, I think the, uh, our, this is also very important. The Korean government uh, tried to uh, the expand the, the Chinese, I mean, their market share in Chinese market through new uh, approaches named electric transactions. Uh, in fact, the, uh, Korea is, as you know, very well, well known of the IT countries in the world. So by using our technologies, if we can the, uh, promote the so-called the uh, electric uh, transactions, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. trade, commerce between two countries, according to the report, the estimated the uh, market size is about 12.5 trillion won. So it's really a huge market, definitely. So I think the Korean government should have to uh, look at those aspects, uh, what we can do better than the others, and how we can use them to pioneer and uh, increase our market in Chinese market. Well, it was really hard reaching the deal. Let's hope uh, we can get <laughs> the many, most yes. out of it. Mm -hmm. It's time to wrap up. Any final thoughts you'd like to share with us? Well, I'd like to uh, end with a lighter note. I used to enjoy, um, I confess this, used to watch the uh, talk show hosted by Oprah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Oprah's talk show created a lot of uh, celebrities. And one of the celebrities uh, was uh, Dr. Phil, the therapist. Mm -hmm. And he published a book about how to empower your life, uh, entitled as Life Strategy. And one of the secrets he proposed uh, for everyone to empower his life is, we teach people how to treat us, own, rather than complain about how people treat you. And it has been a lot of uproars in Korean society about wealthy and strong people and companies bullied weak and innocent people. Mm -hmm. But it is time for us to do more than just complaining about Korea, a country that they do not want to live anymore and mm. live for another country. Because mm. we all have our own capacity to fight and resist the mm. bullying behavior by casting our vote and raising our voice. Mm. Sound message there. <laughs> Professor Shin? A very short sentence. I think our, um, we have to listen more to the voices from 
the minorities. I think that will be very important for the mature, but to increase the maturity of the Korean society. Mm -hmm. Well, the upcoming elections are figuring prominently <laughs> on the minds of our panelists today. Thank you too very much for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. And that is all for this edition of News Insight. We have a special edition of the show coming up on Sunday about the Korea-Mexico summit and bilateral economic ties. So we'll see you again then. Thanks for watching.